Section 2. Forms of Government. Does the form of gov- does the form a government takes, the way in which it is constructed, have any importance? Political scientists, historians, and other social commentators have long argued that question. The English poet Alexander Pope weighed in with this couplet in 1733. For forms of government let fools contest, whatever is best administered is best. Essay on Man. Was Pope right? Does it matter what form of government takes? Pope thought not. You can form your own opinion as you read this section. Classifying governments. No two governments are or ever have been exactly alike, for governments are the products of human needs and experiences. All governments can be classified according to one or more of their basic features, however. Over time, political scientists have developed many bases on which to classify and so to describe, compare, and analyze governments. Three of those classifications are especially important and useful. These are classifications according to 1. Who can participate in the governing process? 2. The geographic distribution of governmental power within the state. And 3. The relationship between the legislative lawmaking and the executive law-executing branches of the government. Who can participate? To many people, the most meaningful of these classifications is the one that depends on the number of persons who can take part in the governing process. Here are the here there are two basic forms to consider, democracies and dictatorships. Democracy. In a democracy, supreme political authority rests with the people. The people hold the sovereign power and the government is conducted only by and with the consent of the people. Abraham Lincoln gave immortality to this definition of democracy in his Gettysburg Address in 1863. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. Now, nowhere is there a better, more concise statement of the American understanding of democracy. A democracy can be either direct or indirect in form. A direct democracy, also called a pure democracy, exists where the will of the people is translated into public policy, law, directly by the people themselves, in mass meetings. Clearly, direct democracy can work only in small communities where those citizenry can meet in a central place and where the problems of government are few and relatively simple. Direct democracy does not exist at the national level anywhere in the world today. However, the New England Town Meeting, which you will read about in Chapter 25, and the Langemeinde, I don't even know, I had to search that up, in a few of the smaller Swiss cantons in an excellent example of direct democracy in action. Americans are more familiar with this indirect form of democracy, that is, with representative democracy. In a representative democracy, a small group of persons chosen by the people to act as the representative express the popular will. These agents of the people are responsible for carrying out the day-to-day -day conduct of government, the making and executing of laws, and so on. They are held accountable to the people for the conduct, especially at periodic elections. At these elections, the people have an opportunity to express their approval or disapproval of their representatives by casting ballots for or against them. To put it another way, representative democracy is government by popular consent, government with the consent to, of the governed. Some people insist that the United States is more properly called a republic rather than a democracy. They hold that in a republic, the sovereign power is held by those eligible to vote, while the political power is exercised by the representatives chosen by and held responsible to those citizens. For them, democracy can be defined only in terms of direct democracy. Many American citizens... Many Americans use the term democracy, republic, representative democracy, and republican form of government interchangeably, although they are not the same. Whatever the terms used, remember that in a democracy, the people are sovereign. They are the only source for any and all of the government's power. In other words, the people rule. Dictatorship. A dictatorship exists where those who rule cannot be held responsible to the will of the people. The government is not accountable for its policies, nor for how they are carried out. Dictatorship is probably the oldest, and it is certainly the most common form of government known to history. Dictatorships are sometimes identified as either autocracies or oligarchies. An autocracy is a government in which an sing a single person holds unlimited political power. An oligarchy is a government in which the power to rule is held by a small, usually self-appointed elite. 
All the dictatorships are authoritarian. Those in power hold absolute and unchallengeable authority over the people. Modern dictatorships have tended to be totalitarian as well. That is, they exercise complete power over nearly every aspect of human affairs. Their power embraces all matters of human concern. The leading examples of dictatorship in the modern era have been chosen in fascist Italy from 1922 to 1943, in Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1945, in the Soviet Union from 1917 until the late 18, 1980s, and one that still exists present in the People's Republic of China, where the present regime came to power in 1949. Although they do exist, one-person dictatorships are not at all common today. A few close approaches to such a regime can now be found in Libya, which has been dominated by Muammar al-Gaddafi since 1969 and some other Arab and African states. Most present dictatorships are not nearly so absolutely controlled by a single person or by a small group as may appear to be the case. Outward appearances may hide the fact that several groups, the army, religious leaders, industrialists, and others, compete for power in the political system. Dictatorships often present the outward appearance of control by the people. The people often vote in popular elections, but the vote is closely controlled and ballots usually contain the candidates of but one political party. An elected legislative body often exists, but only to rubber stamp policies of the dictatorship. Typically, dictatorial regimes are militaristic in character. They usually gain power by force. The military holds many of the major posts in the government. After crushing all effective opposition at home, these regimes may turn to foreign aggression to enhance the country's military power, political control, and prestige. Geographic distribution of power. In every system of government, the power to govern is located in one or more places geographically. From this standpoint, three basic forms of government exist, unitary, federal, and confederate. Unitary government. A unitary government is often described as a centralized government. All powers held by the government belong to a single central agency. The central national government creates local units of government for its own convenience. These local governments have only these, those powers that the central government chooses to give them. Most governments in the world are unitary in form. Great Britain is a classic illustration. A single central organization, the parliament holds all the government's power. Local governments do exist, but solely to relieve the parliament of burdens, it could perform only with much difficulty and inconvenience. Through, though unlikely, parliament could do away with all local government in Britain at any time. Be careful not to confuse the unitary form of government with a dictatorship. In the unitary Form, all the powers held by the government are concentrated in the central government. The government might not have all the power, however. In Great Britain, for example, the powers held by the government are limited. British government is unitary and, at the same time, democratic. Federal government. A federal government is one which the powers of government are divided between a central government and several local governments. An authority superior to both the central and local government makes this division of powers on a geographic basis, and that division cannot be changed by either the local or national level acting alone. Both levels of government act directly on the people through their own sets of laws, officials, and agencies. In the United States, for example, the national government has certain powers and the 50 states have others. This division of power is set out in the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution stands above both levels of the government, and it cannot be changed unless the people acting through both the national government and the states agree to the change. Australia, Canada, Mexico, Switzerland, Germany, India, and some 20 other states also have federal forms of government today. In the United States, the phrase, the federal government, is often used to identify the national government. The government, headquartered in Washington, D.C., note, however, that each of the 50 state governments in, which, in this country is unitary, not federal in form. Confederate government. A confederation is an alliance of independent states, a central organization. The confederate government has the power to handle only those matters that the members of the states have assigned to it. Typically, the confederate governments have had limited powers 
and only in such fields as defense and foreign affairs. Most often, Confederate governments have not had the power to make laws that apply directly to individuals, at least not without some further action by the member states. A Confederate structure of government makes it possible for the several states to cooperate in matters of common concern at the same time retain their separate identities. Confederations have been rare in the modern world. The European Union is the closest approach to one today. The EU, formed by 12 countries in 1993, has established free trade among its now 27 member nations, launched a common currency, and seeks to coordinate its members' foreign and defense policies. In our own history, the United States, under the Articles of Confederation 1781 to 1789, and the Confederate States of America, 1861 to 1865, also provides examples of this form of government. Legislative and Executive Branches Political scientists also classify governments based on the relationship between their legislative and executive agencies. This grouping yields two basic forms of government, presidential and parliamentary. Presidential government. A presidential government features a separation of powers between the executive and the legislative branches of the government. The two branches are independent of one another and co-equal. The, gover the chief executive, the president, is chosen by the people independently of the legislature. He or she holds office for a fixed term and has a number of significant powers that are not subject to the direct control of the legislative branch. The details of the separation of the powers of these two branches are almost always spelled out in a written constitution, as they are in the United States. Each of the branches is regularly given several powers with which it can block actions of the other branches. The United States is the world's leading example of presidential government. In fact, the United States invented the form. Nearly all of the other presidential systems in the, Western, in the world today are also found in the Western Hemisphere. Parliamentary government. In a parliamentary government, the executive branch is made up of the prime minister or premier and the official's cabinet. The prime minister and the cabinet are themselves members of the legislative branch, the parliament. The prime minister is the leader of the majority party or of a like-minded group of parties, a coalition in parliament, and is chosen by that body. With parliament's approval, the prime minister selects the members of the cabinet from among the members of parliament. The executive is thus chosen by the legislature, is part of it, and is subject to its direct control. The prime minister and the cabinet, also called the government, remain in office only as long as their policies and administration have the support of the majority in parliament. If the parliament defeats the prime minister and the cabinet on an important matter, the government may receive a vote of no confidence, and the prime minister and his cabinet must resign from office. Then a new government must be formed. Either parliament chooses a new prime minister, or, as often happens, all the seats in parliament go before the voters in a general election. The majority of the governmental systems in the world today are parliamentary, not presidential in form, and they are by a wide margin. Parliamentary government avoids one of the major problems of the presidential form, prolonged conflict and sometimes deadlock between the executive and legislative branches. However, the protections against arbitrary government found in the checks and balances of the presidential government are not of the parliamentary system. That is section two.